Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our webinar today. A warm welcome to all of you. The webinar today is Drainage Design, an overview of the Austroads Guide to Road Design 2013. Peter Orman is our presenter today. Now we're very happy to have Peter on board because he did play a very significant role in the update of these guides. So as I said, we're quite happy to have him. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Before Peter starts his presentation though, I'll just run through a few housekeeping matters before we get started. The webinar today will be approximately 40 minutes in duration with about 20 minutes left for questions. Now please don't wait until the end to ask your questions. You can ask them throughout the presentation and we will uh, get to them as quickly as we can. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a rather large audience here today, which is fantastic, but we do ask for your understanding if we don't get to your question today. You can always contact us afterwards. Now, as I said, uh, if you do have questions, please do type them into the questions pane, which is in your control panel, and you can keep them coming throughout the presentation. We are also recording today's webinar. And so everyone who is uh, with us here today will be sent a link to the recording so you can view it back at your own leisure. And you will also be sent a PDF version of the presentation materials. So don't worry too much about taking notes. Just try and uh, enjoy the presentation and feel free to ask your questions. Now, if the presenter asks you or if uh, I ask you at any stage to raise your hand, I see some of you have uh, already um, uh, notice this feature. Uh, it's the little hand icon and you can just click that and then you can see at our end uh, whether or not you have. Now without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Peter to commence his presentation and again thank you very much for joining us today. Over to you Peter. Thank you Angel. The presentation, as Angela has described, is about the Austroads Guide to Road Design Part 5, which is now comprising three parts, 5A, 5B, 5, 5A and 5B. The three parts were developed because there was a need to move from the earlier 2008 version, with, a, with that version attracting significant criticism about the information that wasn't in it and also the lack of worked examples. So these three parts were developed by a working party that comprised representatives from the road agencies across Australia and New Zealand who worked and wrote the various sections that formed into the parts that we now have. That team played a significant role in the contents and I'd like to acknowledge them at the start of this and they are listed at the start of each of the parts. I'd also like to acknowledge that this presentation contains photos and diagrams, many of which are in the parts, but some of them I've obtained from other sources and I wish to thank particularly Monash City Council for their generosity in allowing me to use them for the purposes of this presentation. So because they're new, it's probably timely, Angela, for the first poll here. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do is launch that now. And for those of you who haven't uh, participated in one of our webinars previously, you will get a pop-up box on your screen with the question there, which is, have you or your organisation obtained the three parts? So if you could just click on whichever answer is relevant to you, those results will come through at our end. So we will leave that open for a few more seconds while everyone gets their votes in. Um, we're getting up to almost 70% now. And it looks like, um, I guess, the most popular answer at this stage is, is no. I might close that poll off and share the results with everybody. Now, Peter, can you see those results over on your screen? We do have the uh, majority of people saying uh, no, they haven't, or so 41%. And what do those what do those results mean for you? I think uh, what that means is there's still a bit of an opportunity for people to um, obtain those, and I'm hoping that after this webinar that 
they've um, been inspired to pursue more information that's contained within the guides. Definitely, definitely. Okay, well, I'm going to um, hide those results now and um, we can make a move on with the presentation. Thanks. Um, just before moving, moving into the presentation further, I have a question that I probably uh, would like to address now. Um, the question is about increasing the volume. Um, perhaps I'll just try and move a bit closer to the microphone and I hope that, that helps. So Joshua, um, I'm hoping this helps somewhat for you. And actually on that, if anyone else is having some issues with the volume, uh, if you are using um, microphone and speakers from your computer, you can always try dialing in as well. That sometimes gets a, a clearer, louder um, volume over at your end. So please do try that also. Thank you. So moving from the three parts and moving into each part separately, I just give an overview of each part and then intend to move again back through each part in a little more detail, albeit the detail will be at a high level to enable just an over this overview to get through in the time frame we've allowed. I see you notice some questions coming in and I'll, I'll deal with those um, later at the end of each part. Perhaps if I can deal with that way, um, particularly Simon and, and Rob. So part five, moving on to part five, part five covers the principles and objectives, the safety, environmental issues, operations and maintenance and hydrology. And the photo I've shown here would cover shows some of the outcomes of some of these issues and how you well might choose to deal with them. Part 5A covers the major minor concept, aqua planning, curb drainage, underground pipe networks, basins and subsurface. And Part 5B covers the open channels, culverts and floodways. Now into Part 5 in a bit more detail. The principles and objectives, probably the first important consideration for the designer and the guide outlines that one of the principles is to minimise the impacts of flooding to the community, environment and infrastructure. And I've shown a couple of photos that were taken in the eastern part of Melbourne. This one on the left, it's a bit hard to pick up but there's a petrol station here and that, I'm hoping the photo shows that is uh, like a flood. So no road, road pavements, no surfaces are shown other than water. And the photo on the right is a major arterial road running through an urban area of Melbourne. You can see and the disruption that that would have caused to traffic would have been significant. So considering the principles and objectives, some of these things you need to keep in mind. The guide also then talks about road safety, enhancing road safety, protecting road assets, mitigating environmental impacts. The safety components, we have uh, the safe system and we just provide an overview of the safe system. The um, incorporation of safe system principles is something that's ongoing through the guides. Um, this one didn't have a focus on that because it was just a bit too early for a the feed-in of another Austroads project dealing with that issue. The designer also needs to care for workplaces, including the health and safety requirements, construction and operations, and operations, what I mean is uh, things like pavement sweeping, and, and maintenance, that's repairing things like pits and pipes. The other users of the system, being pedestrians and cyclists, or other users of the road, road system, and then components of the drainage network that the general public need to be cared for, things like culvert openings, drainage basins. And these aspects are covered within that part of the guide. The guide then talks about environmental issues and, and these cover a wide range of these issues. And these need to be identified through the design process. So the guide talks about some of these impacts such as climate change, fauna passages, pollution, water sensitive design, erosion and sediment. 
the information contained within the guide is only introductory, but there are cross-references to other publications for more information. This example here shows a lizard run through a culvert. The lizard run is on a shelf elevated from the uh, bottom of the culvert. Next aspect to consider is pollution. The example here, and pollution can come from from several areas, and such as spills and debris, and treating these um, pollutants from these uh, things like the crash that I've shown here on the screen, this plane, this is a plane that landed on a, another major arterial road in eastern Melbourne. And the uh, effects of cleaning that up, would, some of it would end up into the drainage system. And so just considering the impacts of some of these things. There is a cross-reference to other documents for the treatment of uh, pollution in the storm water. Um, the, the idea of developing the guide was not to unnecessarily replicate information that could be obtained from another source and cross-references to the other sources are contained. I see we, we have a few questions and I'll um, take those on board at the end of this part, if you don't mind Joshua and Craig and it. The environment also covers water sensitive design. And the approach taken through the guide is to encourage designers to take a holistic approach to management of water and provides an outline of some of the treatments that are used to contribute to water quality. These, uh, again, the aim here is to introduce the treatment rather than go into um, too much detail. The example on the screen I hear come, is a bioretention trench here. And this photo on the right is a very early attempt, and this one is uh, actually not in Australia. This one is uh, a roundabout with the centre area actually sloping inwards. Um, you can see by the tyre marks some of the challenges that might come with these treatments, and whilst the, t the tyre marks on here only impact on the edge, you can imagine that in, in uh, developing these treatments, designers need to be aware of how they might operate. The guide then talks about erosion and sediment control, where to consider it, by inlets and outlets and some possible treatments. There's also guidance on protection measures, on flow velocities for different types of stream beds, and some information on erosion and sediment control. The photos here, this one on the left, is just the effects of erosion on a table drain. And the photo on the right is one where the local agency has had an attempt at trying to reduce sedimentation by slowing the velocities. And the white sections here, the three you can see on the screen, are actually a coarse rock um, assembly where they're shaped in a rounded shape with the idea of containing and slowing the water and containing some of the sediment. These were constructed on a fairly steep slope and I'm not sure how they performed. Um, I found these, uh, they're in a location in the eastern United States. These were constructed on a local road with only a uh, few properties, so not a high volume road as well. Drainage considerations. So the next major section in part five. There's some guidance on the design considerations, generally covering covering the road and stream alignments, geographic location, i.e. urban or coastal, and environmental issues. And then discusses the flood immunity and the selection of uh, an appropriate ARI and flood immunity with some standards suggested based on the impact a flood may have on the service being provided and the importance of the service. For example, a hospital having a high level of importance, 
hence a higher immunity level is suggested. The consideration of freeboard is outlined. The free freeboard for different locations within the drainage discuss, drainage system is discussed, i.e. Uh, for pipe networks, basins, open channels, with suggested heights for the freeboard. The application of freeboard is illustrated here, and I've shown two of the examples out of the guide for different situations to show this concept. The operations and maintenance of the system are also to be considered by the designer. And the operation is, uh, looks for things like inspections, and usually after a reasonable storm event, um, an inspection might be, would be made to see how the drainage system coped with the uh, storm that happened. Um, we also talk about maintenance inspections, but we don't. The guide doesn't provide a, any guidance on the frequency of inspections, and road agencies would need to develop their own inspection cycles for this purpose. There's some discussion on failures. And they, they could be by a number of reasons and suggested in the guide, things like inappropriate design, poor construction, changes in site conditions, and extreme events. And the more common failures such as erosion, undermining and sedimentation are, are discussed. And then some remediation and, re and information on the factors that may be con contributing to the failures. final section of part five outlines the hydrology components. This information takes on the assessment of the storm flow runoff and takes into consideration the catchment characteristics. One of the key in inputs is the rainfall information. And in Australia, we're referencing the Bureau of Meteorology website for IFD tables and they're just part of their web page is shown here. And in New Zealand, they, they use a, the National Institute of Water and Atmosphere software package called HERDS, or High Intensity Rainfall Design System. So that's where rainfall data is suggested to be sourced from. The hydrology method outlines or provides just information on, the, on some methods of analysis it focuses on the rational method as being the one appropriate for the purposes of this guide and for the road design. So the, in the rational method, it's really appropriate where it's appropriate. And they're, they're shown on, on here with up rural catchments up to 25 square kilometres and urban catchments up to one square kilometre. To support the rational method, information is provided on the time of concentration and various agencies across Australia and New Zealand use slightly different methods and these are summarised in the, in the guide to provide the local jurisdiction with their local method. In New Zealand, the Ramsar Kerpich method is used and it's probably they use a different method because of the different characteristics of their catchments. The guide then talks about runoff coefficients being developed from the fraction impervious and being adjusted for rainfall characteristics and then describes the impact of progressive catchments and in urban areas the partial area effects. To conclude the section, some worked examples on the application of these design approaches is included. And these will go and be worked through at the workshops that are commencing later this year. So I'll just pause for a few minutes for some questions. And yeah, we are getting um, quite a number of really detailed questions, which is great. It shows that there's obviously a lot of interest in this particular subject matter. And as Peter did touch on um, very briefly, we are running a series of 
uh, proper detailed training workshops where uh, these deeper sort of questions will be will be covered and addressed. So we do encourage you to register for those if if this is an area you'd like to learn a bit more about. And we'll uh, we'll put up some more information about those training courses later on in the presentation. Um, Peter, we, we did receive um, a few questions. Craig and Joshua actually had the same question on what is a lizard drain, so um, that seems to be a popular one. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Craig and, and Joshua. What is a lizard run? It's simply a ledge, I'll, I'll use my words here, a ledge for lizards to actually travel through a culvert without having to travel on the floor of the culvert. So, it gives them an opportunity to stay away from, from debris or other materials or perhaps even some predators. So it's an elevated ledge within the culvert. Fabulous. We, um, we also have a question from Amy. Um, does this part cover waterways and contour bank considerations? Uh, the part talks about the need to be aware of the conditions under which you're designing. Um, so in the context of contour banks, I'm just not sure what what the context of that question might be. So. Oh, perhaps uh, Amy can uh, follow up with us after the presentation. Uh, as I did say earlier on, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a very large number of audience members with us today, which is fantastic, but we do ask for your uh, understanding as we, we probably won't be able to get to all of the questions. You can certainly follow up with us after the presentation, though. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question and then we'll, we'll move on just so we... Um, we can get finished on time. Uh, we have a question from Martin. If you're using, well, pardon, him, if you're using the Nash rational method, are you recommending using the 1987 ARR IFDs or the BOMs, new revised IFDs? Lots of acronyms in there, Peter. Yeah, thank, thank you, and thank you, Martin. The guide makes reference to. Um, Australian rainfall and runoff, but suggests that the Bureau of Meteorology IFD charts um, are the ones to use, and I think um, they're, they're quite simple to use and can give you a, a rainfall data for any location within Australia. Um, you need you need to provide some location data, and and this usually is pretty readily available to be inputted into that website. All right, that's great. Um, Peter, I'll uh, let you move on with the presentation and um, we will address any unaddressed questions after the presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. Just moving on to part 5A. Part 5A covers the major minor concept, aquaplaning, curb drainage, underground pipe networks, basins and subsurface. The major minor concept is outlined generally to show the two systems that operate particularly within the urban environment. And the photo on, I've shown on the bottom right of this screen here shows in part how this may work. Um, the brown running down here, that is a road. You can see the abutting development and the uh, relationship with that flow and the abutting development. So you're managing the larger storms through the, the, la the major system and then other storms through the minor system. Aquaplaning is outlined and the types of aquaplaning are explained. Um, the types of aquaplaning generally discussed uh, what's called viscous and dynamic and when these may occur. And there's uh, information on assessing the uh, potential for aquaplaning and what might cause it. The diagram shown here just shows how aquaplaning may develop and just in front of each of these tyres is a wedge of water forming where if the hydro pressure builds up large enough it can 
cause the tire to lift off the road surface and hence aquaplaning. And the guide suggests this water film depth be uh, a depth, a desirable depth of 2.5 millimetres. Again, there are some worked examples in the guide and we'll also be working through aquaplaning at the workshops. Curb drainage is outlined with starting with the factors that need to be considered in undertaking the design of curb drainage, including and one of the key criteria is the flow widths and suggested widths are provided and these relate to the type of users, including pedestrians and cyclists. I've included a photo on the bottom here where the road is past there's a there's a wedge of water coming out near to the centre line of the road. So I'm not sure what road what this road was designed for in terms of flood width, but you can see the impact that if you don't consider this what it might have. The guy then talks about the types of inlets and I've just shown three examples here. We have a side entry, well the, the types of inlets uh, discussed, a side entry, graded and a combination of grade and side entry. In the example shown here we have the, the graded entry. Some might hear its uh, position, it's unclear on the contours of the road but its position maybe could be improved you would think. And we have a, a slotted curb opening. This is particularly used in, in flat locations. And a side just a straight side entry or curb opening pit, which we see commonly along the road. Then to move into the analysis or and design of the the curb flows. We call uh, things like gutter capture and pit spacing. There's uh, the theory on on this is outlined within the guide, so you can use uh, or or calculate the, the flows in your channel from first principles. Well, probably uh, more commonly there are um, charts available for, for particularly for pit intake capacities. This helps uh, set from the uh, flow widths and set your pit spacings. The guide provides a worked example for the gutter flow capacity. And again, this is included in the workshop. Uh, Angela, the poll here on the use of pit charts maybe? Absolutely. So I will just launch that and everyone should get that up on their screen now. So if everyone could click on their answer, either yes, no or unsure. Hopefully it won't be unsure, we'll, we'll know either way. <laughs> okay, we'll just leave that open for a few more seconds until we get everyone's votes in. And it looks like the majority of people are actually answering yes. I might close that off now. So thank you to everyone for voting and I'll just share those results with you. So Peter, as you can see, we had a majority say yes, 48%. And um, what does that say to you? Um, well, that, that's not, uh, not terribly surprising. I think um, designers tend to use the um, most appropriate method available to them and if they have a tool like a, a chart that's already had the calculations done for them, we'd use them. I'm, I'm interested in what, what, whether the other 50-odd um, percent, whether they use first principles, but that's a question perhaps for another time. Sure. Um, all right, I'll just uh, hide that now and we can get on with the presentation. And just before we do, um, I keep getting questions about uh, the webinar recording. Yes, we are recording today's webinar and everybody who is here today will be sent a link so that you can watch it again at your own leisure. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Angela. Yes, continuing on now uh, with part 5A, it uh, then provides a lot of information on underground pipe networks and talks about 
uh, the design of these and, and understanding the outfall conditions that you may encounter, which includes um, when you're connecting into an existing drainage system. So some of the outfall conditions could be submerged, and they could also be influenced by, by tides. And so designers need to be aware of the outfall conditions which, for which they undertake their design. The photo here just shows a possible an outlet condition which is partially submerged. So that's an example of some of the influences on the design. We then talk about access chamber locations and where they're appropriate. For example, at the changes in horizontal or vertical alignment and then and the spacing of the chambers, particularly for your maintenance requirements and maintenance access and so it's well worth talking to the maintenance staff about their requirements when spacing out the access chambers. The location of the chambers also needs to consider the other road users and particularly where you may need to incorporate them into a pavement area and keeping them out of wheel paths. The guide then outlines the pipe network components, things like I've mentioned that access chambers and pits, but locations and the location of pipes and trying to reduce your head loss as the water flows through the, the chamber. Two examples here, one that's not so well aligned with a turbulence being created and the one on the right being a little better aligned where turbulence would be reduced compared to the one on the left. Other design criteria include the, uh, the pipe structural requirements, taking into account things like fill height, uh, material and, and uh, traffic loadings. And minimum covers are suggested for the type of pipe and different locations. The guide also talks about the types of joints and where these might be appropriate and the types of joints, particularly being flush or rubber ring joints, so where they may be appropriate to use. And then talks about pipe flow velocities with the guidance on the maximum and minimum flows that you should be aiming for with your design. And in the actual design of the pipe system, we go into the hydraulic grade line design and giving some background on information of the flow conditions that may be encountered. An example I've shown on here is one of several in there just showing this one shows the steady flow pressure grade line model. The idea is to just show how the energy line is impacted on these different flow models. And then provides a guidance on the losses that occur in the system and going back to the figure there showing the losses as, you, as the flow moves down the system. Things like pit losses and pipe friction losses and also includes exit, at, exit losses. And we've included some information on average head loss factors as through pits. And the sizing of pipes Generally, you use the Manning's equation or the colbrook white formulas. And uh, some pipe charts are, an example of a pipe chart is included with a cross a reference to the Concrete and Pipe Association for more information who provide a few more charts. We've included some worked examples of the hydraulic grade line design and we'll go into more detail at the workshops. Basins are outlined and the, their characteristics, particularly for flood attenuation, they can have some pollution control and ecological uh, benefits. The detention basin is outlined in a bit more detail um, and it, there's commentary on the basins, whether they be wet or dry, some design principles and there's a flow chart included to undertake the design of the basin. Some of the information that needs to be considered in these is embankment, embankment shapes, the basin floor grades, the outlet structure 
an inlet structure and protection of both this and the spillway. There's a worked example within the guide and more de again at the workshop this will be going into in a bit more detail. Part 5A concludes with uh, a short section on subsurface drainage. This is uh, principally covered in another Austro's guide, the guide to pavement technology part 10. And so part the drainage design guide aims to introduce and provide some basic information on subsurface drains. And what we've included is things like where does the water come from or the sources, some of the controls that can be used, such as protecting pavement layers, subgrade treatments, the location of the drain, so where typically would you put them, for example, placed along the road on the low side of the pavement, from both sides near any cut to fill line. And also reminds everyone, the designers, about the maintenance requirements and access to these systems. There are worked examples in the Guide to Pavement Technology Part 10, so there's no further examples provided in the guide. So at that point, we'll just go to any questions. Fabulous. Again, we, we don't have time for too many um, because we did get a rather large number of questions coming through, but uh, we have one here from Craig. Thank you, Craig. Does the guide address construction loadings? Uh, it make, the guide makes reference of it, but um, exactly for, for the details, um, you would need to uh, go to the site relevant to the site. Um, the site conditions. Um, however, there is some information within the guide on construction loadings, but um, uh, so may, I think it's in part five. Um, but again, there's, there's really an introduction to this um, this concept, this principle. Uh, we are getting a few questions uh, regarding where people can purchase the Austroads guides from. Uh, I guess visiting the Austroads website, uh, we do have the, uh, the web address uh, in future slides, so if you just keep an eye on that. But I think it is just www.ostroads.com.au. You can purchase direct via the website as well. Um, when you attend one of the ARB workshops on the drainage designs, you'll also be able to purchase the guide with your registration. So thank you for that question, Craig. Angela, there's a, another question I know comes up a little bit about the status. I think the status of the guides and whether they supersede or override or take the place of other guides. And um, it, what is the situation with that? <laughs> well, Ostroads Austroids produce these guides, and they are guides, and that's a key word in, in this exercise. But it is still, and, and the guides are endorsed by all the rate agencies, which includes local government in Australia and New Zealand. Um, but they're not, they're not mandatory. And each agency may, may not agree with everything that's in a guide, and they'll produce a supplement to sit alongside the guide. Um, the goal of Austroads is to have these guides adopted by all the road agencies and really in, in the long run to have minimal or no supplements supporting them. So they don't necessarily override, but if your agency adopts them, then I think that's, that's where you should start from. So thanks for, thanks for that question. That's a great answer. Thank you, Peter. Um, Peter, we might just take one more question and then um, move along with the, the presentation perhaps. Um, we have one from Renan. Uh, what method do you use in determining uh, the size of the um, detention basin? Well, that, um, Renan, unfortunately, um, that method of uh, the method there is outlined in the guide and and I'd like to come back to you outside this question time if I could on that. Um, I'm just trying to focus on a bit of the overview with this presentation. So if, um, 
if you'll have to bear with me on that response. Fabulous. Thank you, Rena. We'll get back to you on that shortly. All righty, Peter. Okay, the final uh, part is dealing with open channels, culverts and floodways. It starts off by, by giving a description of uh, the types of drains that you experience within the road networks. Um, we have table drains, diversion drains, catch drains, side drains, median drains, inlet or outlet drains, batter drains, bench drains, contour drains. And we add something a bit different called swales. So I thought it would be worth how many different types of drains and these are described in where they might be used within the guide. In the photos I've shown here, we have the batter drain at the top left. It's a bit hard to see, but it's actually that white, lighter bit down this, this batter. We have the table drain down the bottom and the swale on the top right. The open channel, we go into the fundamentals of the open channel design and we talk about stream dynamics and how important it is to have some understanding so that the planning and design is appropriate and it will work when it's completed into the future. The design for the fundamentals of the open channel flow are generally covered by the, the what we call the fundamental equations, that is Q equals VA, Manning's equation and the hydraulic radius. Manning's roughness coefficient is outlined for a variety of channels, including man-made and natural channels. And these are included to assist in, in the design of these, uh, these channels. The flows in channels uh, could either be subcritical or supercritical. And these are described with a recommendation to achieve subcritical flows. Whether you, where supercritical flows change to subcritical, you may end up with a hydraulic charm. And that's really just dissipating energy with the turbulence and the rise of the water. I've showed here an example of a hydraulic jump. And this one occurs on the Mississippi River up in Minneapolis. And the hydraulic jumps can be used in road design to dissipate energy and minimise or prevent scouring downstream. So the design of open channels in, is the methodology to undertake this is included with a worked example where and guidance on where you have a transition from a, one cross section to another and how that impa may impact on the channel, where the channel bends and the alignment and some guidance is provided on the energy losses that occur when the channel has a bend. And there are five worked examples for different channels or cross sections and the determination of the flow rates, depth and velocity of flow. In designing culverts, the next section in the part, there are a number of issues that are outlined. Things like locating the, the culvert, which is usually determined as there is an existing stream, and trying to achieve good hydraulic performance and good and maintaining stream bank stability, eliminating or minimising the risks to errant vehicles of the, the structures, the costs to construct and maintain. And the guide, the guide provides information on the alignment, both the horizontal and vertical. There's also information on the types of materials suggested for use and, and where they may be appropriate. Um, there's, there's information on the structural loadings for different pipe types. And there's cross-references to other documents such as the Australian standards within the information provided on, on the structural adequacy of the pipes. The hydraulic design considerations for the culvert, there's an outline of, of information on 
outlet velocities, siltation and blockage, and headwater and tailwater levels, with the most important consideration being the hydraulic performance and whether the flow is subject to inlet or outlet control. The diagrams here just show is just two of two of eight of the conditions that may be experienced by a culvert for inlet or outlet control. We've included a procedure for determining the flows under outlet control, as this was the preferred control if you could achieve it. And information is available or provided on the entry losses to the culverts. And uh, there's a flow chart included that steps the designer through the process for designing a culvert and concludes with a worked example of the design procedure. And this will, again, this is another area that will be covered in much more detail in the workshops. The culvert outlet protection is an important area and this is outlined with uh, information on end treatments. And what's been included is the an example of design of a rock pad. And I've shown here on the bottom right just the example of another end treatment. So we need to consider its location, particularly for errant vehicles to make sure they can negotiate and travel across these types of structures. The final section, part 5B, covers floodways. And floodways have been a very topical issue over the past few years, in particularly in Queensland and Victoria, with major flooding occurring in, in uh, some of the areas. There's been very many reports on the safety issues of arising from drivers trying to cross these facilities. And this has been highlighted uh, several times during flood events. One of the issues for road managers in floodways is how to manage these features when, when they're being used, utilised, and whether the options are to close the road and deny access, or to, at what level do they keep, it, keep the road in operation. So the guide gives some outlines on the considerations given to a floodway and where they may be commonly used and then the design of a floodway and the, their components. We've also included some design procedures for flow over the road. Going back to some of the important things are things like time of submergence and time of closure for these floodways in considering the design of the floodway. Time of closure is important as it does disrupt traffic transport routes. And one of the key air purposes of a road is to provide transport and so the dilemma for the road manager is, is how the best way to deal with the particular event that occurs at a, any time. There is a, uh, another Austroge project deal looking at this issue. Um, they're not due to finish their work until later in 2014 so unfortunately we couldn't include the, the benefits of that project within this guide. I'm sure later guides will pick up any issues that come out of, out of that research. And concluding on floodways, there's some information provided on, on protecting the banks or the, of, the, of the road to ensure the integrity of the road. And we provide some types, examples of types of uh, protection. The example shown here is just a simple rock protection and there are others this is just one of several others that are shown within the guide. So concluding part 5B, so for any questions? Alrighty, thanks Peter. I'll let you catch your breath there. Um, <laughs> we have a, a few questions relating to culverts actually. Um, so uh, the first one is from Devi, which is what method do we use to design culverts? Uh, Debbie, unfortunately, I'll, I'll have to take that one on notice. Um, uh, I'd rather, I'd, I'd like to go back and refer to the guide for you, so I'll take that one on notice. Thank you. 
Alrighty, thank you very much. Um, we have one, another one on culverts. For culverts under, sorry, for pol uh, I need to uh, catch my breath there for a second. For culverts under pavements, does the guide look at ESAs, traffic loadings, to suggest the minimum amount of cover required for pipe or box culverts under the pavement? Now, is that one we can answer now, Peter, or perhaps something we can get back? Well, only only very generally. Um, there is some detail on uh, on uh, loadings within the guides, but there is a, a suggestion of an absolute minimum for box culverts in particular. Of uh, a, a minimum depth is suggesting the guide. I just can't recall what it is at the moment, but I know there is a recommendation in there. Alrighty, we have received a question from Craig um, regarding um, the questions being asked and, and the ones we aren't able to address today or, or the ones um, on notice. Uh, Craig, we will absolutely endeavour to get back to everyone. However, if you have a burning question that we haven't addressed in the presentation or uh, at question time and uh, it's very important and urgent to you, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, there are a lot of attendees here today and we are getting a lot of questions so uh, if it's very, very urgent please don't hesitate to give us a call and we'll give you uh, the contact details later. So thank you Craig. Um, Peter, we might do another couple of questions. Um, we have one from Ritesh. The question is, I have been I have been setting tailwater level at 75% of culvert pipe capacity. Will that be optimum design? Please provide advice. Perhaps uh, we can't go into too much detail at the moment, but um, is there anything you can add to that, Peter, just briefly? No. <laughs> no, I think, I think, um, I think uh, I need to explore that a little further with Pratesh. Absolutely. And, and look, some of these questions are very um, in-depth ones that would require more than you know, what we have time for today. Please do consider registering for the workshops as, as most of these questions will be answered during the course of those courses and you'll have more one-on-one -on -one time with the presenter also to, to clarify any, any concerns you have. Um, we have a question from Brendan. Brendan asks, um, where are we able to obtain the culvert design sheet? Uh, a culvert design sheet? Um, I'd have to I'd have to check. I, I don't think we included one in the in the guide. Um, I haven't got the parts with me unfortunately is to have a look for you, Brendan. Um, that's all right. Perhaps Brendan can give us a call afterwards and we can have a chat about that one in more detail as well. All righty. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, just in summary, the um, parts 5, 5A and 5B have been expanded to provide more information, design examples, work examples for the designer to appreciate and undertake their design of the drainage network. There is also information there in, in some areas in a general sense and there's cross references to other documents that assist and inform the designer in making their decision. So in concluding, um, perhaps we've I would just like to finish and, and um, let everyone know that there is a feedback mechanism on the guide. So if you see something that is deficient in the guides or feel something is deficient or an error, the feedback mechanism is via that, that uh, web link. Um, and all of those um, requests that go through that system get a, will get a response and be fed back into the next review of the guide. Absolutely, and we will be um, we will be sending a copy of this presentation out to everyone also. So don't worry too much about trying to take down all these um, web addresses and email addresses. We'll um, we'll get all that sent out to you via email shortly. Thank you.
Now the training courses we've been talking about, they're commencing in December. Absolutely. Right uh, here in Melbourne is the first course that we're running and um, I can say uh, it, it is actually almost full. So um, we've had a wonderful response and I, and I hope through this webinar we've been able to encourage people to really get behind the guides and, and learn a little bit more about the subject matter come along to the workshops and, and all of your burning questions will be answered then I'm sure. So as you can see we'll be coming to all of the uh, major capital cities. We do also do uh, in-house workshops so if your organisation um, is one where there are a number of staff that would require this training you can always contact us or um, perhaps a, a quote or just a, a chat about what we can what we can do for you. Um, registrations are open for all of those workshops and of course if there is demand we will run more. So please feel free to register for those. Peter, is there anything else that you would like to add at this time? Um, look, I'd just like to, to thank everyone for your interest. Um, We've moved from one, one part to three parts and um, some of the detail that we was raised today I need to just um, go back back to the guides to adequately answer those rather than relying on, on my memory here today. So thank you for all the questions and your participation. There's some contact details on the screen at the moment. And I provided my phone number and an email and my preferred contact is via email because um, we're out of the office a bit of the time. So an email, if you have a question on, on something, um, feel free to email me at the web address shown. Okay, great. And look, uh, Peter, a big thank you from myself and the Knowledge Transfer team for giving up uh, your precious time to develop this webinar content and for presenting for us today and also for making yourself available to um, all of those who joined us today who, who had some unanswered questions. So thank you Peter, thank you everyone for joining us and we hope that you can join us for our next webinar. All information about upcoming uh, webinars and also training workshops and conferences can be found via the ARB website. Please keep an eye on your email, I will be sending a thank you email shortly and through that you will receive your link if you do wish to download the presentation and watch it again at a later time or perhaps share it with your colleagues and friends. Thank you everyone and we'll see you next time.